Hey, this is former Blue Devil O-Lyman Matt Skura. You're listening to Basketball Conference, the ACC football podcast. Go Duke, go ACC. All right, welcome back in Basketball Conference, the ACC football podcast. My name is Mike McDaniel. Season previews roll along. We're here talking about UVA this evening. Justin Ferber, CavsCorner.com, friend of the podcast. He's editor-in-chief over there. Justin, welcome back. How's it going? How's your summer been? Pretty good. I'm almost out of eligibility on this podcast, I think. I think I've done like four now. I know. Um, I, th- I think we're, I, I don't know, you might, you might have your COVID year left. We'll see. We have yeah, yeah. We check yeah. on that. UVA is a seventh year senior this year, so I think all the rules are kind of <laughs> out the window. I, yeah. Uh, Cam Rising is still playing quarterback in college. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A weird, a weird, a weird year. Um, yep. I, I think we're finally almost done with the COVID eligibility stuff. I think we got like a year or two left and that'll just make everything a lot easier in terms of like previewing teams, recapping teams, figuring out yeah. what eligibility is. Um, I feel bad for the SIDs because, uh, you know, you see a guy listed as senior and I'm like, this should be his last year. And then you don't really know. Like, yeah, it's like, yeah. It's like, did he get, do you have a COVID year or not? Did he redshirt or not? Oh, he had, he did that twice. So he's got COVID yeah. year and a red shirt. Oh, great. So he's a sixth year. Senior. It's just a mess. Yeah. And the guy, the guy on UVA's team that has a seventh year, Cam Butler, he's a defensive end. Uh, he was a transfer. He came over. He had played three years, so he played his fourth year UVA, his fifth year UVA, and now sixth year. And then it was like, or no, 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 sorry, two years at UVA. But his last last year, he got hurt, and so he got a medical like a medical waiver on top of the COVID year in the free year or whatever. And somebody asked him like, "Why don't you want to like stop playing?" He's like, "I don't want to get a job. Like, I'd rather do this than work. I'd rather just keep so, playing football. This is yeah. fine." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. I, I think that's an underrated part of it. I feel like a lot of people get real frustrated. Like college football fans are like, oh my God, get a job. And it's like, yeah, or I could just keep playing football. Especially now if you can get paid for it. I was going to say, I, you know, it, it, back, it, it, back then it was like, oh, well, I can get, you know, I could play football and, you know, get my college paid for. Now you can do that and also get paid. So the motivation there to keep playing right. football, I feel like is pretty high for a lot of these kids. So let's talk about UVA three and nine last year. And I, I guess off the top that the first question I want to ask you in regard to Tony Elliott and his job security, obviously, you know, year one gets off to a, a rocky start cupboard was bare a little bit. And then the tragedy, obviously with the shooting at the end of the year, well chronicled, we've talked about it with you on this podcast, obviously in the past heading into last year, three and nine a year ago, right? Coming off of that. And I feel like you don't want to say that a tragedy like that or some, or something serious that happens off the field affects job security, but I feel like it gives you a little bit more leeway, unfortunately, when you talk about in, in football terms, I'm like, okay, what is, what is the direction of the program moving forward? And I feel like you're, you almost, you have like a little bit more leeway, a little bit more cushion in regard to like, okay, this was obviously something that, you know, nobody could have predicted. Right. And it affected the team in a palpable way, um, affected everybody who was on the team a couple of years ago and then comes into the year last year. And, you know, everything's different and emotional in so many different ways. And there's no real game plan, right, on how to handle anything like that. And I'm just curious now going into year three and acknowledging that the success on the field obviously has not been probably what the UVA administration was hoping for when Tony took the job a couple years back, but then also, you know, towing the line of like, okay, there have been extenuating circumstances here too. So I'm just curious, like holistically, heading into year three, what is what does Tony Elliott's job security look like? You know, if this thing bottoms out, is there you know potential that UVA makes a change? I, I guess we can start with that off the top. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have kind of like framed this as the first maybe like normal year, if you want to call right. it that. I mean, right. The first, and obviously you're kind of still coming off of COVID. That was before he got here. But, um, you know, like there's been a lot of irregular stuff that has happened around the sport and and here. Um, But, yeah, I mean, the first year, the last two games got canceled, you know, obviously with what happened. And um, and that's year one for a coach anyway. So sometimes those can be odd. 
Um, right. And actually, it's weird because they had kind of higher expectations for that first year because Brandon Armstrong was back and yep. like Dante Van Wicks is back, but they didn't really have an offensive line um, yeah. and things like that. But and then last year, I think everybody kind of knew going in. I think we probably, if you went back and listened to what we said last year, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I bet it was something along the lines of like, there's not a lot of pressure. Like, you know, people right. kind of are, it's almost like a, you know, let's just see what happens. We know that, you know, things have been obviously not so great off the field. So right. um, they've had to deal with a lot. And, and you know, it's sort of a, a big reset. Um, and the season on the field went about as people thought it would. Right. Um, you know, from a wins and losses standpoint, how they got there was a little odd, but, <laughs> yeah, um, sure. but yeah, I mean, I think going into this year, it's like, I mean, I've talked to people who are like, this is really like the first real, like full recruiting cycle that they've gotten and stuff like that. And I think some of that's a little generous um, because I think last year, like once they moved past the tragedy, I think they kind of had a somewhat normal year. It's just, you're dealing with all of that in addition to your typical football stuff. Like, right the first home game you're honoring the players and um, you know, the first game they played, you know, was on the road and that was a big deal. And like, it was on ABC and, you know, they're making a big deal about, you know, them returning to the field and all that stuff. So um, I I think like, you know, that situation sort of, you know, I don't want to say like bottom goodwill because that makes it seem like he did something, you know, he had something to do with it or something, but like, you know, I think it just kind of puts everything a little bit on hold as far as like the vitriol, Right. Um, as far as this year, I would say like he's relatively safe. And I think that's really because a, a combination of factors. I don't know that it's as much like um, about the tragedy now. It's more like I think that the administration believes in him. Right. Um, and they could be wrong. I mean, they wouldn't be the first, <laughs> um, right. you know, uh, to, to, you know, be like, hey, we thought this was going to work out and it didn't. Um, so yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't completely write off like if they if things like really flamed out on the field this year. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't completely rule it out, but I would say it's unlikely because I think a lot of people on the outside would be like, oh, if they went like four and eight, he's probably gone because that's three and three and seven, three and nine, four and eight. I don't know that that's the case. I think that might just put him on the hot seat for 2025. Yep. yep. Um, with the with the possibility that if like it just looks really bad or if they go like two and 10, they might be like, you know what, this isn't working and. I know, like the last thing on this is like his buyout is not big. Um, I don't know why, but like his contract is not something that they would have trouble getting out of. So yeah, and that that last part's interesting too because like usually that's what it is. I mean, like with Mike London, it was like we knew where it was headed, and it was like they just didn't have the money, right? Right. And like Justin Fuente was kind of in the same same boat thing with COVID yep. happening during that time, and you know it's like you kind of know it's like, all right, this guy's just going to run out the string and maybe next year he turns it around miraculously and saves his job. But like, we kind of know that's not going to happen. Right. Um, yeah. T- I don't think he's in this situation here because like his buy, I don't remember the exact number, but it's relatively low. And I mean, honestly, at this point he's in year three. Like if he does well, you start to talk about extensions because he's yeah. getting to the end of the contract. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if he doesn't, then it's kind of like, 2025 would have to be just from a contractual standpoint of make or break year. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. And he signed what, did he sign a four year deal when he, I think it's five. Five. Um, so, I mean like, yeah, if it was four, I mean, they'd already kind of need to be working on it. Um, right. I'm looking it up as we're talking. Yeah. Um, that, that was, that was a, that was my thought too. It's like, but well, like the buyout was like relatively low to start with, but every year it goes lower. And I think this year it's like 4 million. Which like you you know how nil stuff works like you can like, <laughs> like, well I mean quit yeah pretty quickly I mean the way things are the way things are going in college athletics now it's like well if it, it's always been this way but I think even more so now that you know you're you're buying rosters it's well look if if this isn't working we're pulling the money okay well that's it then that that's it for your coach and it was like that before but I think even more so now especially with more money in the sport than ever before, especially in the, in the manner in which you, uh, you need to, you need to bring talent onto your roster. Yeah. Six I, years, I, six years. So he okay. might not, the extension stuff, you could probably kick the can down the road a little on that, but For, yeah, you'd have definitely. to, but even, even with that, you'd have to have something done probably by the end of year four. Right. Because you don't want to have a coach with like less than two years left on his contract. Definitely. Yeah, definitely not. Um, especially if things start going in a good direction, then yeah. I think you're definitely starting to I think to if he like extension. went to a bowl this year or something, they'd probably extend it or maybe just extend it by like a year or something like that. But 
And then like, you know, with like Tony Bennett and his contract, it's just an automatic one year extension every year. Yeah, right. So, like stuff like that's pretty common. The, the one thing I'm curious about too is like, obviously the administration believes in him, but it got off to such a like weird start mm-hmm. in terms of the, and we talked about this, I, I think last year. And then obviously in, in his first season that the whole pursuit of Tony Elliott was just yeah. so, you know, the whole back and forth and, you know, he left without a contract, then he came back and it was this whole back and forth. And then ultimately, you know, he lands the job as expected. Cause I think a lot of people were a lot of, a lot of reports were out there that he was the guy, you know, he was going to be hired. Um, and, and it went down that path for, it felt like a few days where it was just like, all right, is he actually going to leave Clemson? For it was a UK weird, job? yeah. And, and Duke was in the mix too. Yep. Like, so there was that. Um, yep. But yeah, it was a weird couple of days. <laughs> for, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that'll be interesting. I, I think it all really just starts with the fact that Virginia has got a, a pretty decent offense coming back. I mean, this was an explosive offense last year at times, and I know they, they juggled quarterbacks and off the top. I mean, Tony Musket is still on this roster and we've already seen kind of the highs and lows of Anthony Calandria as a freshman, like what he brings to the table and the explosiveness um, in, you know, the best version of him, right? This offense was exciting when he was on the field and then Musket came in and I think a lot of people were kind of scratching their heads and then he started playing pretty well towards the end of the year. So heading into Elliott's third year, he's got to get quarterback right. Mm-hmm. And I feel like he's got two pretty good options. So what are things looking like this year now heading into fall camp? Because last year it was like, all right, if Musk gets healthy, he's the guy. We know nothing about Calandria, you know, from the outside. Mm-hmm. And then Calandria got in on the action a little bit. We're like, are, <laughs> is this the better quarterback? You know, that was a question a lot of people were asking. So now heading into into his second year with, with these two quarterbacks in the room, I'm, I'm curious kind of where things are at now. Yeah, it's funny because last year – like uh, Calandria enrolled early and played in the spring game and played a lot because they just didn't have depth at quarterback. And right. people were like, huh, like he actually looked pretty good. But it's like, okay, it's a spring game. A lot of guys are out hurt, stuff like that. So you can't really take too much from that. And then in camp, <laughs> Tony Elliott was like, Anthony Calandria is pushing Tony Musket. And we kind of thought maybe he was just saying that because it's like, hey, it's competition. Like he's trying to motivate Tony, you know, right. whatever. Um and people were like, "Why is he doing that? You're like creating a comp- you're like creating a controversy or whatever." And it's like, honestly, I think he was just telling us the truth. Yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, I mean, like Tony started the season; that was kind of the expected thing. He gets hurt in the first game. Calandria comes in and played four in a row, I think, and they didn't win any of those games, um, but they were close. I mean, they they had JMU on the ropes and probably should have won, but then they had like a rain delay. And after the rain delay, JMU came out and, like, closed the game out and scored two right. quick touchdowns and won. Um, but he played well in that game. He had moments at Maryland, but ultimately kind of imploded in the fourth quarter like you would expect a freshman to do in his first right. road start. And then NC State, he did okay. Uh, had kind of a dumb penalty at the end. But, um, you know, but then Musket comes back in. Musket beat UNC on the road yeah, um, yep. when they were undefeated. First time UVA's ever beaten a top-10 team on the road ever. <laughs> um so, I mean, like, you know, kudos to him for that. He beat Women Mary, too. Um, and then he gets hurt again, you know, against Georgia Tech, and Calandria ends up kind of finishing the season. Yeah. Um, and by the time that te- the Virginia Tech game rolled around, um, I- obviously their record wasn't great, but Calandria had played so well the previous two weeks against Louisville and Duke winning the second game right. that people were like, even if Musk gets healthy for Tech, I think I'd rather see Calandria play. Um, and obviously that didn't work out, but – like, you know, going into this year, I think most people kind of just like just talking to people. I think a lot of people assumed, oh, Calandria will be the guy. And it's like, yeah, it's not quite that straightforward because Musket didn't play bad. He just got hurt twice. Right. Um, and, you know, health is part of it. But and, and Calandria probably has more upside, especially given his age and compared to Sina Muskets. But yeah, in the spring game, they were pretty much dead even. Um, and I think that's really where they are. Like, I think Calandria probably ends up. If you had asked me to bet on like who starts more games or plays more snaps, I'd probably say Calandria. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if Musket wins the job just because of his consistency. Like talking to the quarterback coach on Friday, they had a media availability session for us. He was saying like, you know, Calandria is explosive, Musket's consistent, and it's like, you know, you they have to figure out which one they value more. 
right. for this team and like which one can play behind an offensive line that could be better, could not be better. We don't know. Um, I think it's a really close competition. And, you know, I, I think they don't want it to linger into the season. They kind of want to pick a guy, but like obviously Muska got hurt twice last year. So yeah, got to be and, right. And, and Anthony's not the biggest guy in the world either. So like, I feel like both of them will end up playing at some point. You just hope it's not because one guy played poorly. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's based on injury like last year, well, at least you know your second quarterback, whoever mm-hmm. ends up being, is ready to go. Um, I think that's a good point too. Like, I think that's just so people can kind of understand the the framing. It's not a competition where they don't like either guy and they have to pick one. They like right. both of them. Um, and it's and honestly, it's like one of the better quarterback situations I can remember UVA having for for having multiple guys anyway. Um, it's been it's been a while. I mean, like I, Brennan Armstrong was was more productive than either of them, but like. Um, or and like Bryce Perkins, obviously, but right. they never really had to compete for their job, like right. Um, and you know now it's kind of like it's pretty open, and um, we'll see. I mean, I think people kind of, I think the fan base would probably rather see Calandria because he was more exciting and he's younger and there's more yeah. upside long term. Yeah. Um, and that could certainly be the direction they end up going, but I think like coaches you know you've heard like there's so much coach speak about like we're going to compete at every position and all this you know like you hear stuff stuff all the time i really think they are going into camp like we don't know who it's going to be like we're going to just find out yeah which is not i mean it's it's definitely not the worst position to be in because i look there are definitely worse quarterback situations in the conference and what uva's got going right i I know you look at the schedule last year and you're like all right uva went three and nine but there were a lot of issues outside of quarterback you know, that that yeah. were the reason why the, the season finished the way that it did. I mean, I think you go into camp and and see what happens there. And, you know, I, I, I think, too, like, yeah, the fans want the the upside guy, right, the, the exciting youngster, and they want him to get experience. But also, like, these coaching staffs don't think that way all the time because they can't. They're, they, you know, especially yeah. in situations where you're coaching for your job, which, you know, I, I know we just kind of set the table that Elliot's probably safe, you know, unless it really, really gets bad. But, like, these guys are very year-to-year in terms yeah. of, hey, we need to win right now, like, almost all the time. And I, I think ratcheting up the pressure heading into year three, this is going to be a, a win-now uh, situation, I feel like, when they when they select the starting quarterback. But yeah, I don't I mean, think they can go wrong. I don't think they can go wrong either. I, I think there's, you know, the upside versus consistency thing you said I think is really important. Yeah, and I think, like, if you're a coach that's worried about not even maybe, like, getting fired, but it's like we need to show – results right Right. because even if they don't you know like even if he's not going to get fired if they go like five and seven or four and eight they need to win games um for recruits and and just you know to show progress um take take a little pressure off heading into you know 25 for example yeah so you could see where a coach might say like tony's the older guy i think he came to uva with like he played at monmouth he had like 27 career starts yeah obviously he played here you know he went to carolina and won they went to overtime with Miami with him starting. So like I could see them maybe being like, let's go with the older guy and see how things go. But I mean, you know, it's a tough situation and and that's part of it too. Like any competition, I think that like, if they're really close, you kind of do have to weigh like what's worse. Anthony makes some mistakes out of the gate and we pull him or like Tony makes some mistakes and we pull him. Because I think for the, for like the morale of the fan base and the team and everything, it'd probably be an easier sell to put Calandra in off the bench than it would be to bench him after like two games. Um, but, you know, ultimately they have to decide what's going to help them win against Richmond week one, right? Like they can't play games yeah. like that. And, and like their second game, they play week four. So it's like, you, they don't have like a big ramp up or right. anything like that. So. You gotta be ready to go. And yeah. especially with the way Wake Forest is, you know, heading into the year, that's a very winnable game. Yeah. Um, and and you don't want to leave that one out special. there. Yeah. Cause you're playing games at quarterback. And, uh, and the good thing is I think they believe in both guys, but like, you know, one of the coaches told me the other day, like, yeah, you know, I, we feel good about those guys. It's going to depend on what the five guys in front of them do, you know? Yeah. Like, right. If, if we can't block, it doesn't really matter who's back there. Well, I mean, let's talk about that then. Like, it's a veteran offensive line returning. Yeah. And, I mean, you tell me, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because, I mean, that, I think, you know, we talked about reasons why UVA struggled last year. I mean, you could put offensive line near the top of the list. Yeah, I think, you know, they pretty much bring back the same guys. Um, it took them a while to kind of figure out who their five were last year. Right. Um, they were shuffling it, quite a bit. Yeah, they had a bit of a disaster at center out of the gate. That first game against Tennessee, um, and I, I, they were kind of blaming the, the turf a little because, like, 
uh, Titan Stadium. They put down some like turf that no one's ever used before. Right. Um, but like they couldn't snap the ball. That was like a big problem. So they ended up moving, swapping their guard to center and vice versa. And that actually helped fix that problem. And Brian Stevens, the center, ended up being like the best offensive lineman. And now they hope they have their tackle situation figured out um, with Mikhail Bowley, a left tackle. And then Blake Steen was a redshirt freshman that kind of came on the second half of last season and started, I think, the last five games. And they feel really good about where he is. So I feel like going into camp, I asked the offensive line coach on Friday, you know, last year it was wide open. Like they didn't have a single starter penciled in anywhere. Right. Um, you know, they brought in some transfers, but they didn't know if those guys would start or, or whatever. Um, and they didn't really bring back a single guy that was like a sure starter. Um, this year, I think you could really say all five positions are kind of solidified. And now it's going to come down to like what the competition and health looks like behind them. But I think it's a good thing uh, for this group because I think that there's enough talent there to where they can hold their own. Um, I don't know that they're necessarily those five guys are going to, you know, have a bunch of all ACC type performers, but right. if they can get some consistency and stay healthy, because that's one of the issues they've had the last few years is like just being banged up in camp and not getting that time together. Um, I, I think like this, they'll probably, they probably have like five guys that'll start obviously. And then like two or three more that could play. Um, that's not as good a depth as depth as you would want to have, but like, it's not awful. It's better than where they've been. I mean, I went back and looked at what that line looked like in 2022, and it was like they were playing guys like, uh, <laughs> you know, like on a team you'll have like a redshirt senior who's like in his fifth year, but he's never played. Yeah. And it's yeah. like that guy was playing. And it's like they had not like two ideal. of those guys starting, and it's like, well, there's probably a reason those guys have never played. Right, yeah. not And, and, and there's a reason that they're playing now, and it's because you haven't developed anybody. By, and it's part of that necessity. was like – yeah, part of that was like when the staff got here, um, Bronco basically the, the offensive line from 2021 was pretty good, and they've had some guys go to the NFL, but like everybody left. Like they all went to Portal. Olu Olu Batimi went to Michigan and was an All American there. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, they lost a guy to USC, they lost a guy to UCF, they lost one to SMU. So like their whole line left, and then they just didn't, Tony's staff didn't have the time to kind of go out and replace them with that recruiting class because it was like, two Weird weeks timing. before early signing day right yeah. and there's just nobody available and luckily Bowley and steen were guys that they went out and found that were like not really highly rated guys um and they've developed into solid enough players and you know i think also like the offensive line transfer portal is like tough for everyone there's just not a lot of quality players it's a crap shoot too like yeah. they gotta be they i feel like it's hardest and I'm, I'm interested to see what coaches say about this, but I do feel like it's hardest to, it's the hardest position to, to recruit yeah. out of the portal for sure. I mean, they got, they got two transfers or three transfers last year, one from Houston that hadn't really played there. And he's like a rotational guy, but not a starter. Jimmy Christ, whose brother played at UVA was a four star recruit out of high school in Nova signed with Penn state transferred to UVA. Hasn't really played. So he had like the pedigree, but hasn't played really. Right. He's been a backup. The guy that is playing, Brian Stevens, was from Dayton, which is non-scholarship FCS. Yeah. And the only reason they really got him is because somebody recommended him to the offensive line coach, like a, a friend at, a, at another school. And, you know, it's like <laughs> – that just shows you right there, like the non-scholarship guy is playing in the ACC and, like, a fo former four-star recruit isn't, you know. So that's just – it's just a crap, total crapshoot. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's certainly at the very least it's hard to portal in starting offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. I feel like you can find some depth guys and you know maybe take a flyer on a couple of highly rated guys that you know haven't panned out at a prior stop. But it takes a while, I feel like, to develop the depth that you need out of the transfer portal. I think that's why so so many teams are yeah I want to say reluctant to bring in offensive linemen, but I think just kind of struggle with it. Or it's so. like they're bringing in a guy that like all those guys I mentioned for that UVA got were available for a reason. Like, right. Right. Uh, the guy from the guy from Houston, uh, Ugandan and now that they brought in, like he hadn't played. He was like a backup. And UVA had a lot of playing time <laughs> available. Um, you know, obviously Brian Stevens is going from Dayton to a higher level. Um, and then Jimmy Chris wasn't playing at Penn State. So it's like, you know, they were all kind of available. Um, and, you know, every once in a while you'll hit with one of those guys, but really it's about development over time. And with the guys you have. And the good thing is like a lot of like the offensive line that they have now, those guys have been in the program now, basically since Tony got here, um, right. most of them. So they've gone from like really raw 
Um, I mean, the offensive line coach told me Blake Steen, the right tackle. He said uh, he wasn't here for Tony's first year. He came in for year two. He's like, when I got here that first spring, I looked at this guy and was like, he'll never play. For us. Right. He's right. not, he's not good enough. Um, and he now he's, but he turned it around, you know, like, and kind of proved him wrong. And then, you know, like last year he started playing and he played pretty well. So, um, and I guess that's a testament to his work and everything, but like, that just shows you right there how big of a crapshoot it is. Like even right. he was like about to be written off, you know? Yep. Um, and, and now, you know, he's a starting right tackle and, and for good reason. Let's take a quick second to remind you about section 103.com. It is the internet's premier place for all things. Wonderful Georgia tech apparel. They've got t-shirts. They've got sweatshirts. They've got hoodies. They've got a short sleeve coach hoodie. If you want to look like coach key, they've got onesies for babies. They've got all things for any man, woman, children, something for the whole family, all the Georgia tech fans in your life. They need something from section 103.com. Use promo code GOACC for 10% off your first order. Uh, you can go get t-shirts supporting NIL efforts with guys like Haynes King and Zach Pyron. They've got shirts supporting the basketball team, the baseball team, the volleyball team, all sorts of wonderful tech traditions, all sorts of things. Again, any Georgia Tech fan in your life, they need something from section103.com. Uh, once again, use promo code GOACC for 10% off your first order. Uh, I particularly love the Feliz Bobby Dodd sweatshirts. Uh, we got Christmas season coming up before you know it. You're going to want one of those for your holiday party. Go get it all at section103.com. Huge shout out to Steven and the gang. Thank you so much to them for their support of the Basketball Conference podcast. We would love it if you guys would go show your support for section103.com as well. Uh, now, back to the episode. The, the one thing that UVA didn't struggle with is bringing in skill position guys because they, they portaled hard there. Andre Green from North Carolina yep. um, is a big one. Obviously, Chris Tyree and other. You got to replace Malik Washington. So, you you know, it's hard to replace that guy all by himself. So yeah. you bring in multiple guys to kind of do that job. I feel like Virginia has got to be feeling pretty good about where they're at. I didn't even mention Kobe Pace at running back, but I feel like they got to be feeling pretty good about where they're at in terms of like the guys they brought in, the proven commodities, guys who have gotten it done at other schools. Um, it, it's not a group of five, you know, situation. You're bringing in like power five talent uh, to kind of supplement whoever the quarterback ends up being, and that'll help out the offensive line in turn as well. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, I would say. <laughs> You know, we, we talked to all the coaches on Friday. I, I talked to Adam Mims, the receivers coach, for a while. And the vibe I got from him was, like, co like quiet confidence. He was kind of, oh, like, yeah. you could tell he feels good about his group. And a yeah. lot of those guys were here in the spring, so we saw him. You know, we kind of know. But, I, I mean, like, we were, Mal Malik Washington had, like, the like out of the blue, one of the best seasons I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, all I mean, American, we knew he was yeah. going to be wide receiver one. But he had 42 catches or something the year before at Northwestern playing in every game. And he yeah. had like 110 last year. Um, I think he was like second in the nation in catches or something. Yeah, he was one of the best receivers in the sport. Yeah, uh, it was basically him and Malik Neighbors, <laughs> like yeah, the two best right. receivers in every category. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, it was crazy because everybody knew he was getting the ball. And it's not like UVA had that many other options to throw to. They basically had two guys that caught all the passes. Um, all right, yep. The, the good news for them is Malachi Fields is back. Um you know, he's, he's like a different kind of player. You know, he's an outside receiver. He's a bigger guy. So he's going to go up and get contested catches. And he's not going to be a 100-catch player because that's just not the kind of guy he is. Um, but Chris Tyree, I think – I mean, I, they, they're not out here – they basically have, you know, poured water on the idea that, like, we're trying to replace – uh, it's like the meme from Moneyball. It's like they're trying to replace like, Washington in the aggregate. Right, um, right, right. They're not going to be like, oh, Chris Tyree will just be that and catch right. 110 passes. Right. If he does, great. You know, but like, they, I, I think that they have plans for him to be like one of their kind of possession guys that's going to catch a lot of balls. Dre Green, I think we'll see. I mean, I think I'm I'm optimistic there, but obviously, like he didn't play a lot at UNC, or like when he did, he just didn't get a lot of targets. And obviously, right, right. they had. They had good receivers, so it's not like he wasn't playing for no reason. They had, you know, Tess Walker and all these guys. Um, right. So we'll see there, but there's there's definitely talent there. And I think one of the things with him and Tyree that they really liked is that they're both local guys from Richmond. So bringing them home was kind of a nice sell for them. And then obviously, to be, I, I think that they, they kind of struck gold last year at the receiver position because then they were able to go out in the portal and sell Malik Washington's success to everyone else. So Huge. like – yeah, it's yeah, I mean, like, I don't know that you get Chris Tyree 
if I mean, I'm almost sure that they wouldn't have if Malik Washington didn't happen first. Um, because he was he had interest from bigger schools and he decided like, all right, well, the, there's an op- there's an opportunity here, and they've shown that they can kind of develop guys and um. And then they have a bunch of younger guys that are kind of on the way up. So Darian Harrison was a freshman last year. I think he's going to be a really good player. Um, they brought in another transfer, Trell Harris from Kent State, who is just really, really fast. Um, and I, I think that they've got a lot of talent at receiver. And that's kind of the most exciting thing about this season, I think, is that you could potentially pair, like we talked about, especially if it's Calandria, some explosive players with potentially like big play-minded quarterback play and that's something that you know they they just haven't really had a lot i mean bryce perkins could make that stuff happen a lot of that was with his legs yeah um, yep and and brendan could do it but you know he had like Dontavian wicks and keaton thompson and guys all over the field so i think they're trying to kind of bring that back it's, like i said it's going to come down if they can block enough to get those guys open because they probably got like i would say like three or four legitimately good receivers and then like probably another four guys that could be that you yep. know, and they'll all just yep. be kind of fighting. For, and then also, I want to mention, like, they brought in two transfer tight ends. And the tight end position, they haven't really used a lot under the staff. And they really wanted to. Because, like, that Clemson offense, they always had t- t- tight end play. Like, they used it, the tight end as an H-back a lot. Um, and, and they haven't really been able to do that stuff as much because of the personnel. They just didn't really have a good group. Like, that, a group that was – they had one guy that was, like, decent and a bunch of other guys that are just, you know, they haven't really done much. Um, but they got Tyler Neville, who is like an all Ivy League tight end at Harvard. He's from Williamsburg. He, so he hasn't been here yet. He had to finish his degree. Um, but I think expectations are that he'll be a really solid player. And then they brought Sage Ennis in, who was like the second tight end at Clemson last year. Yep. And um, he's coming off an ACL, but apparently he's good to go or will be soon. And that'll be interesting. But, you know, he knows the scheme and, you know, he didn't have a lot of production at Clemson, but. I think him and, and Neville together will be the best tight end group that they've had, and I think that that'll kind of open up some things for them. Kobe Pace at running back, knowing the system, yeah. I think is important too, especially he had success um, in 2021 yeah. with Elliott running the show there. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm weirdly, I don't want to say weirdly bullish, but it, I am going to say weirdly bullish on, on this UVA offense if they can literally block anybody, just because I feel like this, yeah. the skill positions are as deep as I can remember in a while. Like, I feel like there is a level of proven production there at several spots that we simply just haven't seen going into the season on paper at UVA in quite some time. That's how it feels. Yeah, I think that's true. And the running back position, I'm, I'm not as, uh, I'm a little bit more anxious to see just because they don't have a lot of depth, experienced depth. So right. like Pace has played a lot of football. Behind him, it's like Xavier Brown, who played as a freshman two years ago and then missed all of last season. Um, and he played really sparingly because they had like five other running backs ahead of him. Um, yep. And then, uh, you know, they have a couple redshirt freshmen that didn't play last year that are there. And those guys will be kind of fighting for time. But Pace is going to be usually like the last like three or four years, it's been running back by committee, basically since Wayne Talapapa left. Um, <laughs> that's that's a, a blast yeah, from the past, right there. Oh my god! Yeah, um, guy but like since, ele- guys have guy like eleven carries for forty yards. And yeah, exactly. But he'd have like touchdowns. three touchdowns. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he was like a touchdown machine. But yeah, since this staff came in, he left, and then you know they had a couple guys leave, and they basically had like a walk on Paris Jones that became a starter. Mike Hollins obviously played and had a good year and, last year. Yeah. And Kobe pace, they were all kind of rotating with each other a lot and you, on any given down. It could be any of those guys in the game. Like you right. now it's like, it's Kobe's show because those other guys just aren't experienced. And Xavier Brown could end up being a complimentary player because he's fast and he could catch the ball out of the backfield and all that stuff. But um, it's going to be Kobe's Kobe's show, I think for the most part. So they'll have to be really careful to keep him healthy. Um, but not as much depth there, but, you know, if they can run block a little better. And then I think if Calandria plays, that's more quarterback mobility too. So yeah, for sure. But they're going to be, a, they're going to be a pass first team. Though, I think they're just going to have, I feel like, I feel, yeah, I was going to say, I feel like they have to be with the receiving talent they brought in. Um, the one thing I want to just go back to quickly. And I, I thought it was a really good point you made the, the replacing Malik Washington in the aggregate, but also mm-hmm. like the type of receiver, right? You talk about Sedarian Harrison, Chris Tyree, those are like smaller 
receivers, yeah. right? And Malik Washington was a smaller guy. I don't think anybody is expecting um, UVA to all of a sudden start churning out all Americans like it's slot receiver. But I, I think the point that you made about look, if Malik Washington doesn't have the year that he had last year, they probably don't land Tyree. It's probably true because we just saw a guy who was kind of in the likeness of Tyree just have an explosive like career year mm-hmm. um, and put him obviously in a strong position get to, yeah. to get drafted. Exactly right. By Whereas, year. right, yeah. versus like, you know, being at Northwestern and being in this kind of like weird spot where you're transferring and just kind of like hoping to have a really good year and – I mean, to become an All-American, like, I mean, it's unbelievable. So, yeah, I mean, I think UVA has done a really good job bringing in the the receivers that are a lot like Washington in that regard. And I think Tyree has the explosiveness, too. We saw it at Notre Dame, obviously, transition from running back to receiver. We know he's got home run speed. I mean, he's, yeah. he's an electric player. Too. Yep. Yeah, and, and he did it well at ND when they, when they allowed him to. I, I know they you know, they moved him to receiver at the end and he wasn't returning punts as much, but you know, he's got the capability of doing that. He's got that breakaway speed. So that adds an intriguing layer. I feel like to Virginia's offense. Yeah. Tony Elliott said that Chris Tyree is the fastest player he's ever coached. <laughs> and I was like, Whoa, like, that's I mean, cause he's coached some pretty fast players. <laughs> that's yeah. a statement. Yeah. And you know, but like, I mean, we'll, we have to see what that looks like on the field. Right. Um, but you know, like, that's, that's exciting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, I think that that's kind of how a team like UVA is going to move the ball. Like if they can't really run the ball like a ton and they don't have a quarterback that's going to run all over teams. And, and Calandra actually had some success with his legs down the stretch. I think he had like a 90 yard rushing game against Duke. Um, like if your quarterback's playing from the pocket, I think that they just need guys that can move the chains. And if you can get like Washington, a lot of what he did was, you know, he'd catch an eight yard pass and that would be enough for the first down, but he'd get you an extra 15, right. you know, and, I think, like, if they could find a guy that can do stuff like that. And, and Washington, obviously, like, we've talked about this, like, on our podcast. Like, there's a very good chance that that was just a weird one-off thing. Right. Like, I mean, right. I don't think I don't think they're going to all of a sudden start producing 100 catch guys. <laughs> right. But, right. But, I mean, like, Malik, uh, Malachi Fields also had a good year. He had, like, 60-something catches or whatever and a bunch of touchdowns. So. Yeah, almost 900 yards, I think. Yeah, and, and that – so I think Adam Mims is doing a good job with that group. Um, he he kind of came over. He came over as an analyst um, for the first year, and then when Marcus Higgins left, he got promoted, and people were kind of like, "Okay, like we'll see what this guy can do." And his his early returns have been pretty good. Defensive side, I, I mean, let's start with the defensive line because I feel like UVA mm-hmm. just portaled they they portaled in a defensive line. It felt like so. <laughs> what's what's the outlook here up front um, compared to a year ago? I feel I feel like defensively it was just really up and down all year last yeah. year. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a mixed bag for sure. Um, the year before, you know, they, they were much better than expected because Broncos last year, the defense was horrible. Um, and, you know, and it had been kind of trending in that direction. Um, yep. And when Tony's staff came in, he hired John Rodzinski from Air Force, and it was kind of like, that's a good hire, but, like, he's not going to be able to do much with this group now. Yeah, like, their right. defense is going to be bad. Right. And they were, like, surprisingly good. And the offense was terrible. Um, which is exactly you know the inverse of what everybody expected with Brendan Armstrong and all the yeah. way back. Um, Thought that was a certainty. Yeah, and they, and they did a pretty good job getting after the quarterback. I was writing something about that this morning. Um, and then last year, the like sack and, and TFL production fell off the table completely. Um, and I think that was a big part of the problem. And, and it all you know how defense is. All this stuff is connected, right? So like the first year that this staff was here, they had two really good corners in Fentrell Cypress and Anthony Johnson. Cypress obviously was like one of the top portal guys last year, went to Florida right. State. Yep. Johnson's in the NFL somewhere on a practice squad. <laughs> um, those guys both left. And then the, the, we knew last year it was like they, were, they weren't going to be able to replace them like with what they had. It, it, just, was, it just wasn't going to be – whatever they did, it wasn't going to be as good. Um, and I think that was part of the problem is like those guys were able to create some coverage sacks in year one and cover up some issues by just covering down the field and – in year two, that coverage wasn't as good. So, like, you know, the, they just didn't get to the quarterback enough. And, you know, like I mentioned Cam Butler's injury and in, in seventh year, like he was a big – his injury, he got hurt in the fourth game. Um, like him not being able to get after the quarterback, uh, you know, that hurt. 
um, having him go down with injury because they just didn't have a lot of depth at that position. Right. And then Chico Bennett, their other good pass rusher, he got hurt in camp. He hurt his knee and missed the first game and ended up coming back. And I, but, and I've never had anybody tell me this, but I kind of just wonder if he just wasn't the same guy. Because yeah, I think he had right. a team high sacks in 2022, and then last year he didn't have a single one. Yeah. Um, man. And so I think he might have just been playing through it. And and they had a freshman that came in and kind of played a little bit down the stretch. And so it's really going to come down to that edge pressure. And and I think, honestly, they're going to still have to get a lot of pressure from their linebackers. But the interior defensive line should be solid. And it'll just be – I think it's going to be like a health thing for this group because, like, especially with the pass rushers, like on the edge, there's not a ton of depth there. But the two starters have shown that they can be productive. They just – last year they kind of had the perfect storm of those guys getting hurt linebackers so i mean you mentioned the the pass rush are going to be a little bit more reliant on on that from the linebacking core i the the one name i'm curious about and you know he was a pretty decent player at akron and he's coming in Corey thomas like mm-hmm. how much is is he going to play is he going to slide right in as a starter and then you know what what's his role going to be on this defense yeah i haven't penciled in as a starter i mean yeah. we'll see but he's kind of like, it's kind of like what Bud Foster did defensively. It's not really the same setup. They run, UVA runs a four, two, five, but Bud always had that like in the box safety player. Yeah. Like a, he called it the whip, I think. Yeah. He, basically UVA, like they have, it's on the UVA depth chart, it's like the saber position. Yeah. So he'll be in that role. Um, and, you know, they have a pretty like decent group of safeties, but Tom has kind of played safety and linebacker at Akron. Um, and I think he'll be just kind of like an in the box fifth DB. Yeah. Um, but I mean, he's kind of like a linebacker, so I think he can help you against the run and the pass. He looked pretty good to me in the spring game, and and what we saw from him, he's big guy. Um, he has kind of like defensive end like size, like right. like height. Yep. Um, but he can play down in the box. He can he can cover. So I think he'll be a valuable addition there. And then. You know, he'll be kind of – I think they could also, like, if they got in a pinch with linebacker, he could just play linebacker, I think, um, if they needed him to. Or he could play safety, but I think he's a good fit for that, you know, like extra guy in the box type role. But he'll be yeah. playing quite a bit. And they'll have to they'll have to do some substitution there, obviously. Like, in you know, third and 12, he might come off yeah, and another right. corner comes on, that kind of thing. Yeah, Virginia Tech had Mook Reynolds uh, years yeah. ago now. Um, yeah. And he was – it was kind of the – last few years of, of Bud Foster, um, first couple of years of Fuente. And um, I don't know, Thomas's game reminds me, he's not exactly like the same build, right? Um, McReynolds is a little bit smaller, but the, and you the way they play is Thomas was at Akron too. He's like, he, he looks like he was a project at one point and now yeah. he kind of became a productive player. Yeah. Um, so I think like, it'll be interesting to see, but obviously like, you know how it is with the, these guys in the portal, like coming up a level to the ACC, like sometimes it just doesn't click. You know, and, and sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't matter at all that they played at Akron or at FCS school or whatever. Um, so we'll see. I'm I'm very curious. That's why SMU as a whole. I'm I'm very interested to see what they do this year. Just I mean, that's like a base case from like yeah. team wide. But um, I'm very interested to see what they. Yeah, do. I mean, you, they went what ten and two, but then BC beat them in the bowl. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so right, it's like, how right. good was that ten and two? Like we don't know. Right. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Um. The, the the rest of the linebacking core. I mean, how does you know how are the how's the coaching staff feeling about it? Just heading into the year uh, with what they return, and then obviously what they're adding in. Yeah, I mean, I think well, the most exciting guy on the defense is Cam Robinson. Um, like as a freshman, I I didn't I couldn't believe how many tackles he had when I looked today when I was writing a linebacker like position group. He had seventy one tackles, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, two interceptions. One was a pick six against Louisville in a game they really could have won um, on the road. And, you know, he flashed. I mean, he he clearly, like, is learning the game, you know, the college football, because he played at a single-A school, you know, in Virginia, and he was a really, really good player. Um, And the best recruit they've probably gotten, um, out of high school anyway. So, you know, he showed that. He just has athleticism. Like, you could see it at practices. You could see it, you know, early in the season. Like, they just haven't had a lot of linebackers that can fly around like that. I mean, this guy has, like, NFL athleticism. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think if he can put together – I think last year, especially early in the year, he was sort of used as a, like, situational piece because they were like, we don't know if he knows where he's supposed to be all the time. You know, I don't – I don't. They, nobody came out and said that. But, like, 
I, that's how it felt. It's like third down, just run after the quarterback, Bobby Boucher style, you know, <laughs> um, you know, we, we're not going to give you a bunch of assignments. Right. And I think eventually things started to kind of click for him and he sort of became the starter. Um, and, you know, he, he had issues here and there where he, you know, he'd miss an assignment or something like that. Um, I remember there was a big play in the tech game early. It was like, I want to say it might've been tech's first drive. They went for it on like fourth and one. Yeah, and he he missed a guy on like a wheel route or something for like a big play. I can't remember what the play was, but I just remember being like, "All right, that's kind of like a freshman yeah, mistake right. sort of thing." Um, and but I mean, I think he's coming on, and he showed second half of last year. He was like, you know, him and Jonas Sanker are like the two best players on the defense, probably. Yeah. So yeah, um, I'm really excited about him, James Jackson. You know, the other linebacker um, in the four two five. He's a solid player. Um, you know, I, he's he's pretty athletic. Um, he can move around. He, he had 80 tackles last year. Um, he's not going to, like, blow anybody away, but he knows the scheme and kind of knows what he's doing. And, um, he had some lapses here and there last year, but linebacker I feel okay about, and they brought in a transfer from Cincinnati who played a lot there. So, like, if they needed to add a third guy in a pinch or if, one, you know, Jackson struggles or something like that or somebody gets hurt, I think they'll be okay at linebacker. And then, obviously, like I said, Thomas can kind of cover up, you know, any issues they might have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's why, yeah, that's why I was so interested in his versatility, just because, yeah, you know, I feel like he'd be used so many different ways. Uh, the secondary, I mean, you mentioned Sanker, all ACC player, obviously really important to have him back mm-hmm. into the fold. Adding in another transfer, Kempton Shine from Eastern Michigan, who played a ton there. Um, so you got some veteran experience there in the back end of the secondary. Yeah obviously trying to supplement with the portal a little bit, but I mean, having Sanker back there, I feel like makes a world of difference. Just knowing the, the, the known commodity of an all ACC type player. Yeah. You can kind of see, I think he was one of the guys, I mean, he didn't really play for Bronco staff much, but like you could, like, I think he was one of the guys that kind of benefited from that change because he took to the defense right away um, right. in year one. And, and he was making some plays like right off the bat and played early in his career. And then last year he took it to another level and, you know, became the leading tackler on the team and is just like a really solid all around player. Um, you know, he didn't have any interceptions last year, I don't think, but he can play the pass pretty well and he can come down and stop the run. That's why he had so many tackles. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think he's a really solid player. You, just, you know, keep him healthy and, you know, roll him out there. You know what you have. And then you mentioned Shine. Like they brought in a bunch of DBs. Like yeah, I think last year, like I said, the cornerback position, they kind of try to piecemeal together with a couple of like young guys some depth guys and a couple transfers. And it feels like this year they're, they're kind of trying the same thing. I think they just got better players, <laughs> um, right. you know, or guys that, you know, there's more of them. So like there's, there's more options. Um, Sean could play, I mean, he played corner and safety. So like he could slot in at either spot. Um, and then you have Antonio Clary back. Uh, he's a guy who missed all of last season with an injury, which was kind of unexpected because they thought he'd come back after the year. He just, you know, one of those things that just lingered and then he had to have another surgery. Um, But and in the season, but yeah, he's back. I think it's year six for him. He he's played a bunch of football, so he'll probably be a starter. Um, And then, you know, you have some other guys like I would say that they have a bunch of DBs that you can kind of cross train at corner or safety, which I think is a good thing. Um, So we'll see like where that all fits together. But like Kempton Shine and a couple of the transfers, they might end up at corner just because of depth. Um, but you know, they could also play safety as well. And then like, you know, Corey Thomas can also you know, be a safety too. The, the versatility of the transfers is huge. I feel like I'm, I'm sensing a trend there, which is I think really important with the way college offenses are being run right now. Yeah. And the, the, the defensive transfers, the offensive guys, like at the skill positions, like you're like, all right, that, this is obviously a take, you know, right. um, right, like, right. I, I, like Chris Tyree, like obviously, uh, even like Trell Harris, the guy that got from Kent state, like he, he was down to like UVA, Michigan state, Kansas state, and Illinois. <laughs> like that's good. Like I'll take him. If those <laughs> yeah. are the other schools that wanted him. Um, right. and you know, like on the defensive side, it's more, it feels to me more like an evaluation thing where it's like, if the staff likes them, they go after them, even if maybe like other schools aren't on them as much. And then those guys are hit and miss, you know, um, they have a, they had a freshman last year, corner Dre Walker, who like nobody really wanted out of high school. Yep. I think had offers from, I think JMU was an offer, but like that was it. I mean, most of his offers are FCS and he came in and played a bunch last year. He unfortunately got hurt. So like that kind of messed up his season, but 
um, ultimately, like, if they can go out and evaluate those positions well, I mean, I think that that kind of gives you some optimism that the guys like a, like a Kempton Shine who kind of just committed without a lot of fanfare or Kendron Smith from Penn. Um, and uh, they, they recruited another guy from Robert Morris, um, who was a freshman, like conference player, of the, like deep, freshman of the year. Deep pull. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know how much interest that guy had, but like if they feel good about it, it'll, you know, we'll have to see what happens on the field. That's how I feel about the offensive line too. It's like on paper, it's like, it makes sense that they'd be better, but like show me, you know? Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I, and now just like getting into the schedule, I, I'm starting to wonder now, like how much of this is going to be quantifiable in terms of wins and losses, just because of the way the schedule sets up. Mm-hmm. Um, this is kind of brutal. I, I the, <laughs> the, the back the, is the back is not great, or the, the middle to the back. <laughs> the, I was going to say, like starting in October, it is just not ideal. Um, so I feel like you know we we mentioned earlier a little bit that the Wake Forest game in, in week two. I feel like that is just such a gigantic game in terms of momentum. Um, you know, as you actually get into conference play in October. Yeah, like I feel like you need that early win. And looking at the other games in the non-con, I mean, Richmond is, you know, that could be a competitive game. They're at, they're a quality FCS program, but you got to a, win the game. Like, you got, you know? but you got to, but you got to win the game. And then yeah. you know you got Wake Forest in week two, and I you know Wake's losing a ton, and they're in a weird spot. And then Maryland and at Coastal. I think you absolutely got to find a way to be three and one there. If yeah. you have any hope of getting to a bowl game, you agree? Yeah, I do. I, I think like, I think that they have BC. I feel like that's the first what five games, something like that. Yeah. Five. Yeah. 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 And so it's BC, like, I think after yeah, Coastal, it's a bye week. in BC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that by the end of that game, I think you'll kind of know where things are headed. If they're right. like, one and four or two. And this is the same thing we said last year. Like exactly, exactly last year, it was way, like yeah. last year on paper, you know, obviously things don't always go the way that you think they will in the preseason, but like we are like the back end of the schedule is not great. So you kind of have to like do, you know, your damage early and they were over right. five. <laughs> so right. it was like, all right, well, they're not going anywhere. Um, this year it's like you have Richmond, you have Wake, those are winnable. Maryland at home is not like doesn't scream win, but like it's not the craziest thing in the world to think they could compete, especially if they're two and oh. Right. Um yeah, exactly. You know, you have some momentum going into that game. They're they're making a change at quarterback there, you know, so we'll see. And UVA was in a game with them for three quarters in College Park last year. Um Coastal Carolina on the road is unfortunate just because, you know, it's like why? <laughs> like why do you have to go down yeah. there? You know? Yeah. Um yeah. And it's like it, it's a game that they had scheduled a while back, and I don't know if Coastal is going to be quite as good as they've been, you know. But especially losing Grayson McCall and you know all that, and you know they've obviously transitioned coaches and everything. But um, we'll see. I mean, but they're not going to be an easy out. I don't think either. I think they're picked like second in their division or something. Yeah, which is a yeah. good division. Um, and then you have Notre Dame at the end of the season too in the non-con. So. That's not great. But, yeah, the back end of the schedule is, is pretty rough. At least, I mean, again, things don't always work out the way that we think they will, but I have a hard time envisioning the back end of this schedule is going to all of a sudden, like in October, we're going to be like, oh, it's a cakewalk. Like right. Clemson, North Carolina, SMU, and at Tech. Like, you know, like that's not going to be easy. You know? Yeah. And they have Notre yeah. Dame. And even at Pitt, I mean, I don't think Pitt's going to be great, but, like, that's, that's not all necessarily going to be a fun game. It's a weird place to go play. It's yeah. always weird to go there. UVA play. hasn't had a ton of success there either. No, it's... They've won like once there maybe since Pitt joined the league. Yeah. You can say the same thing about Virginia Tech. They really struggle going up there too. Um, I, I mean, I you're going to be hard-pressed to find a a team in the conference with a, I want to say, tougher schedule because Georgia Tech's got an absolutely brutal schedule. So, yeah. I mean, I think this UVA schedule is a little bit more workable than the Georgia Tech schedule. But, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at this and – Well, know, it's also you have, you have to look at it through UVA's prism. So, like, if you're course, looking at – if like, you know, if Louisville had the schedule, you'd be like, okay, like, it's hard, but they're going to win some of these. Like, right. You know, they're, they're going to scratch out seven, eight wins from this. Right. With UVA, it's like you kind of take the pessimist view where you're like, all right, well – they're going to be underdogs in most of these games. Um, but, you yeah. know, just just like in other years, there is a path for them. It kind of reminds me of Broncos' second year 
where people had low expectations, they started five and one and they ended up six and six because they basically were like the back end of the schedule just kind of took, you know, did its damage. Like they played Lamar Jackson and you yep. know, they lost to Miami and, yep. you know, down the stretch, it was like a lot of hard games, but they started fast. So it was like, you know, they were able to squeak out a bowl game and that was huge for them that year, you know, that second year progress. I think this year could be like that if they can get an, a, another good, a good start. Like, the path for them, I don't even know if path of bowl game is like. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would. They're going to have to be better than people think, obviously. Um, you know, but Richmond win, Wake win, split Maryland Coastal, maybe. You know, figure out a way to get one of those. Right. Yep. Beat BC. You know, at home. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean beat, winning four of the first five would be gigantic. Yeah, and then it's like then you kind of have to just find a way to get wins, like from there. You know, I well, don't know. And it's you know North North Carolina. North you know, Carolina at home, home, they might not be that great like this and, year. And you beat them. You, know? you beat them last year. You beat them last yeah. year on the road. And it was a much better North Carolina team, you know. And then and then you mentioned Pitt, like a Pitt SMU. Maybe you figure out a way to get one of those Louisville at home. Maybe they're not as good as people think. Who knows? Right. You know? And I, I think you feel a lot better, you know, if you win four out of the first five. I think you feel a lot better about going to Pittsburgh, right? Like, still mm-hmm. a weird game, but I think you feel a lot better about your chances to potentially win that game. Because I'm with you. I'm not sure Pitt's going to be that great. And right? if they, if, honestly, if they won four out of their first five, they're better than like people think, and they're not that bad. Agree. Agree. That means at that point, unless you had a bunch of injuries, you can compete, like at least, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and yeah, the thing is, like last year, they went three and nine, but. It was one of the weirdest three and nine seasons I've seen. You know, they had, they got, they got well, well, that, and then they got completely boat raced out of a bunch of games too. Yeah. So it's like, we can point to the close losses if you want to make like an optimist. Right. right. So, you know, they, they, they lose to JMU by one, I think. Um, you know, that game, like I said, UV had a two score lead and then the rain delay happened and then they lost um, playing with their backup quarterback too. Um, right at that time, who hadn't really played uh, NC State, they lose on a last second field goal after a horrible sequence of personal foul penalties. Uh, <laughs> kind of derailed, it got it let NC State start their drive at like the 50. Um, Maryland, the game was, that was brutal 21 14 brutal. at the end of the third quarter, and UVA was in the red zone, so that game was a lot closer than it looks. Obviously, North Carolina was close. BC, I think UVA was up two scores at the half. Um, and you know, kind of imploded in the second half. And what else? I mean, like uh, Louisville was close on the. I mean, they were up seven in the fourth quarter yeah. on the road. Louisville yeah. was like nine and one at that it was time. Shocking. Not, yeah, it was shocking. Miami, uh, UVA. It was uh, they lost in overtime. Um, you know, they had to settle for a field goal, and Miami scored. So, yep. And then you have on the flip side of that, and then obviously they beat Carolina, they beat Duke, so like they got some wins. Um beat William and Mary. And then you look at like the Georgia tech result, the Tennessee result, the Virginia tech result. Yeah. Those are all like uncompetitive, not, not competitive from like the f- middle of the first quarter. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, Georgia tech was a little bit weird because Musket got hurt on the, like the third play of the game. Yeah. So like that, that kind of threw them off, but they couldn't stop it run at all, you know? And those games, like, I mean, if you look at those, it's like, this team isn't even close to competing. Right. Right. And it's always, you know, it's almost like you're trying to figure out what's the aberration. Is the aberration the close loss or is the aberration the blowout loss? Yeah, and, and they had almost as many blowout level. losses as close ones. So it's kind of like, yeah, it depends on what you look at. But It's kind of water finding its level a little bit, yeah, you know, exactly. one way or the other. Um, well, it just shows you what the margin is for a team like that. Well, you know, yeah. If, every, if everything goes well, you get out to a lead, you can compete. And if things go bad, you know, it's like – it's going to spiral on you. And I think that's what was happening, especially with Calandria in the games. Like you saw it against Virginia tech at the end of the year when things got down, like started rolling downhill. Yeah. It, they couldn't stop the bleeding and it just got ugly. Like, you know, cause they just couldn't, they couldn't like stop the momentum in its tracks and like reset. They just kind of like let it get bad. And then all of a sudden you're down 28, nothing or whatever. I think that's when the, you start to, you start to see like freshman Calandria a little bit. Yeah, and then you also started to see like, okay, this offensive line's like really, really overwhelmed. Yeah, that um, was that, and then the defense. That was like the defense was up and down last year. They had really good quality play where they they played really well for I wouldn't even say games, but like stretches of games. Right. You know where it was like 
three quarters against North Carolina, they were really, really good. You know, three quarters against NC State, they were really, really good. Um, but then, like, you know, they'd have lapses. And then you have games like Georgia Tech where, like, Haynes King is just running free, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and yeah. Virginia Tech kind of did the same thing. And, and Tennessee, obviously, like, nobody expected them to beat Tennessee. But Tennessee didn't also end up being as good as people thought. Right. So, yeah, week you know, one, looking week back, one that one well. wasn't as – that loss was maybe worse than it looked at the time. Right, right. Yeah, and you never know coming out of week one either. That's a tough thing. Yeah. Especially, especially after the year that Tennessee was coming off of too. It's like, wow. I yeah, mean, exactly. Uh, People Heisman thought they were going to yeah. Right. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having trouble seeing UVA make a bowl game here. But I, what I will say is I think they have a real opportunity – to be competitive um there's a bull case there i mean you know offensive line the continuity i think does matter you know i I do think continuity matters i think the offensive line will be better i really like the skill position players and i think uva does have two competent choices at quarterback right um so i i do think if the offensive line improves and is at least average I could see this offense being pretty exciting, kind of no matter who's playing quarterback. Defensively, you know, I think if the offense finds a way to stay on the field more consistently, I think the defense almost has to improve a little bit. And I think you're returning enough that, that there are a lot of transfers coming in that are going to be impact. You know, they're going to be relying upon to be impact players, right? And I, I think to think that all of them are going to hit, I think would be silly just because it very rarely yeah, happens, you know, way. never works that way. Um, but I th- with all that said, like, I think there's a bull case for UVA to make a push for a bowl game despite the schedule. But I think you really, really got to put pedal to the metal and, you know, the openers on August 31st, but for all intents and purposes, we'll, we'll call it the September schedule. Like you gotta, you gotta find a way to, to go three and one there and maybe pluck Boston college. Cause I, I think if you're, four and one after the first five games like you mess mem- like you gotta find a way to get to a bowl game like you mentioned justin like yeah. there's got to be two wins left on the schedule and i i think if you win for the first five for this bowl case right like can you get louisville at home you know can you beat carolina at home i mean clemson like, you have to go to death huh. valley it's tony elliott great. going home Tony Elliott going home to Death Valley, but like, and Clemson's really talented still, but like, that one doesn't look anywhere knows, near man. as impossible as it did like two years ago. Who, I mean, who knows? Yeah. I mean, Cade Klubnick is what he is at this point. Um, but that's exactly the kind of game that last year they were in, and people were like, why are they in this game? Like, I, well, yeah, they, I mean, that, they did that, like, game. yeah, they did that over and over again. Carolina, they were like three touchdown underdogs and they won. <laughs> um, right. you know, Miami, I think they beat UNC and the next week they were like three t- touchdown underdogs again. They were like Vegas was like, nah, we don't buy it. Yeah. Um, they yeah. almost won that game. Um, you know, they really I mean, I think they led with like, you know, thirty seconds to go and Miami yeah. made a field goal to get yeah. sent to overtime and then they led in overtime. Um, you know, they that game was a coin flip, it just didn't go their way. I, I think yeah. if you look at last year, like even with all, all the blowouts that I mentioned, like it's a lot easier, I think, to make the case that they could have been like five and seven. Yeah. You know, with a three and nine record. Like, yeah. You know, JMU, you literally flip like one play. That game goes differently. Louisville, right. I think you could flip one or two plays and that game might have gone the other way. Miami, obviously. Um, yeah. They didn't have a lot of close wins either. I mean, Carolina was close, but they were led by 10, I think, in the fourth quarter. And Louis, uh, Wayman Mary, obviously, they handled, and Duke, they kind of handled too. So, right. It's not like they eked out their three wins, so. right? But yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 probably like eighty percent chance they don't make a bowl, but like because you could, this could, this could go worse. I mean, like Wake could beat them, Maryland could beat them, and then you know BC could beat them, and then all of a sudden you're looking at two and ten. Um, and then you're asking questions about Tony. Yeah, and I think like I think they need to avoid that. Um, but yeah. I think like if I think it probably feels to me like. Uh, like a four and eight team that you like, they annoy you. Like you're like, why is this team in this? Like Notre Dame's gonna be like, why is this team like down by three in a fourth quarter? Like, yeah, I you know, agree. That sort yeah. Of thing. I agree. I, I'm, 
I, I want to say five and seven, but I think more conservatively, it's probably four and eight just because yeah. I don't know for sure about the offensive line. I don't know for sure about, even though I, I do like the two choices, like you got to nail quarterback and then you got to have several defensive transfers hit. So I, I'm going to go four and eight just because I don't love the, I don't love the layout of the schedule, and I feel like they're going to have to be so good out of the gate so quickly. And I think integrating all these new pieces, I just don't know how realistic it is at all of a sudden. Like the continuity from game one is there in the way that it needs to be against the games in the schedule where you absolutely have to win if you want to make a bowl game, in my yeah. opinion. Um, and I think UVA, like, I do think this team will get better as the year goes on. It would honestly surprise me a bit if they didn't just because of all the new pieces and you know I think you will figure out who the quarterback is by October you know and and I think you'll be able to to move forward kind of knowing who that guy is and if you don't you don't feel fantastic about the direction I would say right at that point if you're still trying to figure out quarterback if the offensive line is still as bad as it was a year ago if you're still trying to find the answers on defense then i could see a scenario where it gets really sideways but yeah i think i think an annoying four and eight is like right on the money that feels yeah, right I, to me i think honestly like i i'll just say like i could i can't say this about every team that i've seen but like i feel like this locker room is pretty good like i don't think they're gonna yeah. just give up right um, but like you know so i mean i've that 2020 like tony's first team i think they were one foot in one foot out like you had a lot of bronco <laughs> right. guys that just didn't really buy in, you know. Obviously, that season went off the rails at the end because of the shooting and everything. But like, you know, before that, it was just kind of like rudderless, and you had a lot of questions about like where is this going. And then last year, I think we did a podcast in the off season after the season, the last yeah. season, yeah. and I, yeah. we were all kind of like, I feel a lot better about like the staff and everything than I did a year ago because, right. you know, they nobody expected them to be good, and they were at least like kind of competitive in some games and yep. maybe found a quarterback. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll see. I think I think the expectations are still relatively low. I mean, everybody kind of knows where they are, and if they exceed them, great. If they don't, you know, it depends on how bad it is um, to kind of go from there. I think the one thing too to add to your point is like, and one of the reasons that maybe I'm not as optimistic um, is they haven't been as good at home as they need to be. Like, yeah, Bronco staff. That that's one thing that they really did. I don't think they did anything different per se, but they won more games at home. Like they just did. Um, and that's how they got to bowl games. They won their home games. Um, and, you know, this staff, I mean, they've won one ACC game at home. Yeah, they're four so, and eight at home overall in two yeah, years. And they've, and they've won two on the road. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, they have to find a way to, like, I'm not saying you have to turn the place into a fortress, but, like, you have to, you have to like, win your <laughs> right. games at home, right. you know? Because even, like, environments that aren't the most intimidating, like, teams win at home just by the comfortability, you know, and everything. Yeah. So, Yep. You know, it's like you just have to, they have to find a way to, they only have six this year. Um, so, I mean, like, that's not great, but you need to find a way to win, like, four of them, at least. Yeah. Because you're not yeah. winning more than, like, two on the road with this team. Uh, yeah, I mean. I don't see a scenario where they go, like, four and two on the road. Well, I mean, know, in three, I happening. mean. Three, yeah, I mean, yeah. three of the road games are Clemson, Notre Dame, and Virginia Tech. I mean, no yeah. thank you. Right? I don't think you're winning any of those. So. <laughs> no thank you. Yeah. yeah. So that's tough. I mean, that's tough. And then the. You know, one of the other ones late in the year is at Pitt, which we already talked about. Yeah, so, and mean, it's just... going to be like 43 degrees and raining. Like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's going to be like 15 people there. I, but that's no an way. example of like Pitt has no atmosphere at all, but it feels like they win their home game. Like, you know, all the time. It feels yeah. like it feels like opposing teams never win there. It feels like, yeah. you know, you, it's like going into, the, you know, Death Valley or something. It's very strange. I yeah. Don't so really they need understand. to figure out how to do that, basically. You know? Yeah. It's an important step to take Win your home games. Right. Um, yep. And then find a way to be just competitive at home and or competitive on the road. Excuse me. So. All right. So I think we're both at four and eight. I, I'm with you. Holy, you know, just. There'll be a competitive, plucky four and eight, and anything worse than that, you know, if it's like a competitive three and nine, I, th I think, it, you know, like you said off the top, maybe a hot seat conversation heading into 25, and then anything worse than that, I feel like, you know, with the point you made about the buyout, I, I don't, man, I, I would have a hard time imagining them bringing him back at two and 10. Yeah, I think but, when you get down, if you get, uh, if you have like three or less, 
or like less than three specifically. Yeah. I think at that point it's like, I think a lot of people like want it to work. And I think that's where they are right now. It's like people yeah. are kind of like, I think that this is going to turn the corner. I believe in this guy. He had a big, like they opened the football facility like a month ago and he had a big part in that. Like he designed a bunch of stuff and like, yeah. and that's not like in a, you know, nobody's building a statue because you designed some features in the indoor facility. But like that shows you how much like leeway he has, you know, and stuff like that. Like they, they're like, it's your program. Like you're not just kind of like here until we fire you. Um, and it feels like a lot of schools kind of do that. They're like, you know, yeah, like Tennessee, you know, it's like you're our coach until we decide you're not. Like you're right. you're like an NFL coach. It feels right. like UVA has kind of turned the you know given him the keys and been like it's your show, you know. And so I think with that they're kind of like all right we're gonna let him do it, you know. And I think after the shooting and everything, like there was you know, I don't, I don't want to say things weren't going well, but like the on field product wasn't good, and I think a lot of right. the guys were just really not in a good headspace ob- for obvious reasons. And I think since then the team has just been really more galvanized and I, I, I give them credit for that. It's just going to come down to the, but it's a results based business. And I think yeah. they know that it's just, it's going to come down to whether they win or they don't win. And I think this year you might get a little bit of a pass because you mentioned the schedule and just the overall expectations of the program right now are not, people aren't like, you know, Rose bowl or bust or whatever, you know, right. um, but eventually like that you know especially in the nil era where you really need people to pony up the money yeah it's going to get to a point where it's like if you're not able to raise that money like you know you're going to have to find somebody who who can energize a fan base and get it done and i you know like the if, if it bottomed out i could see them being like hey like this is clearly just not working um yeah but i also could see them going like four and eight and being like all right like you know another year like <laughs> The schedule was kind of difficult and we had this issue or this injury and things didn't really go that well. But then like, I, there's no way that could happen and he wouldn't be on the hot seat next year. Right. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, they're not going to want to just incrementally just like win one more game. I mean, I I guess progress would be good, but like if, if it's going from, you know, he's kind of like on the hot seat a year in advance. It's like, you have two years (laughs) to show us basically these like next two years. And it could become one if you really, really, really don't do well. <laughs> like, you yeah, know. it's just um, it's just really tough. And even, you know, I understand he took over kind of a weird time from Bronco and Bronco, you know, leaving the program, how he did was a little bit unexpected. But I have yeah. a hard time believing you can go three wins, three wins, four wins, and then just not be on the hot seat in 25, like you said. Like, yeah, you, you got to. You got to win more than ten games in three years at a ACC school in this era, and I think the other point that you made that's really interesting, and I, I think is is important, is we're so early in the NIL era, and the reason why I bring this point up is the big schools, right? The, the big time football programs, the LSU's, the Notre Dame's, the Alabama's, you know, et, et cetera, go on down, down the list. They've always had the resources to fire a coach when things aren't going well and they have like the impetus to do so because they're competing for national championships. But I feel like a lot of schools in these power conferences now kind of have that same thought process in a way that maybe they didn't before, just because a lot of the money from these donors is going into these, you know, these rosters and these coaching staffs in a way that they just haven't at a lot of these schools pre NIL, like it happened at the big schools, but it did not happen across the board like it is now. And I just feel like we're going to be learning something about, you know, coaching searches, hirings and firings at these middle tier, you know, maybe not in UVA's case, but these like mid tier football programs. How are they going to handle their coaching staffs moving forward? It's just going to be really interesting to watch. With And I think NIL has a gigantic factor in this in a way that obviously it, it hasn't in the past. And I'm just really interested to see how that plays out with just coaching staffs and, and the patience level of these schools and, you know, the coaching searches. I, I think it's all going to be really, really, really interesting. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things with this staff, like, I think, you know, one, they kind of came in after Bronco had gotten into bowl eligibility a bunch of years in a row. So Tony didn't get the automatic, like, uh, 
support or whatever you want to call it of like, Hey, we know we're going to suck for a few years. Right. Like people were kind of expecting him to just pick up where Bronco left off and probably recruit better. And yeah. it's like, and that would basically, he would just kind of take it and run. And it's yep. like, it just didn't work out that way. And right. maybe that's a reflection of him and maybe it's not, maybe it's just like, Hey, it was messy and it is what it is. And or maybe Bronco would have bottomed out like that too. You know, right. yeah, maybe, right. maybe that's why one of the reasons he didn't stay. Right. Um, but like, you know, it, his whole offensive line left, for example. But um, yeah, I mean, I think at this point too, like if you're UVA and I, again, like, no, I don't think there was really any chance he was getting let go after last year, unless they went like, oh, and 12 or something. Right. right. Even then, like, I don't know because of the shooting and everything. And that's yeah, probably yeah. fair. But also like if you're a school like UVA, you're not just dealing with your fans and everything, but like you also have to look at the perception. If you, if you let like Tony Elliott, a guy that was like, when they hired him, people were like, wow. Like, even though they had kind of had a drop off that year at Clemson, people yeah. were still like, wow, they got him. Like, that's pretty good. Um, you know, so like pretty good, get a name that people know. Um, if you fire him after like two years and even three, it's people are going to be like, UVA is like out here firing coaches. Like <laughs> after like two years, like, wh- like what? I mean, if you go three and nine, three and nine, three and nine, I think people would understand, but like, you know, I, I think they're just kind of like, all right, we're going to give him his opportunity. Um, and, and UVA is not like a lot of these other places. They don't burn through coaches like in any sport, really. Um, you know, and no, and yeah. I think their culture is like, we want a st- stable culture where coaches don't want to go anywhere. They're comfortable here. You know, they win here. You know, we, we give them their resources and they do their thing. Um, they're not like, you know, and they haven't, UVA's like never had a coach leave for like another job in any sport basically yeah. um, except for like yeah. Bruce arena going to like MLS or something like that. Uh, but like literally like once coaches get here, they don't really leave. So I think that's kind of what they're going for. Yeah. It's just kind of like you have to win the game. It's the same with Mike London. Everybody wanted him to win. Everybody like Mike, if you don't win the games, you can't stay, you know, but, and I think Tony's not quite there yet, but um yeah, I mean, they're going to have their opportunity this year to kind of show that they've turned the corner, and now it's just going to come down to whether they do it or not. Yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. I mean, I I don't know. that. I'm really interested to see what happens here for a number of reasons. I just think the roster is kind of intriguing, and the quarterback situation is very intriguing, and the whole Tony Elliott job security thing to me is very intriguing. So I don't know. This is, this is going to be an interesting team to watch this year for, for yeah. sure. Um, Justin, I appreciate it, man, as always, uh, to have you on, but, uh, want to make sure you're able to, uh, plug your stuff before we get out of here. Yeah. CavsCorner.com camp opens on the winds. Well, I guess I don't know when you're posting this. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> at some point camp's going to open, whether in the past or in the future. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we'll have a lot of camp coverage leading right up to the season and we're, you know, in the throes of recruiting football and basketball stuff. So getting excited for football. It's right around the corner. Um, Usually once they, you know, once they send the email out for fall camp, you know, media stuff, it's like, all right, it's happening. Right. Yeah, for sure. And you know what you reminded me because I needed to say this off the top and I didn't. These are my marching orders from Joey. And this is what happens when he's not on the podcast. We are recording this on the evening of July 28th. So if anything significant happens by the time you hear this podcast, I probably should just mention that off the top. Um, you know why yeah. we didn't mention it on this podcast. So if you be go to the Mac or something tomorrow. Right, exactly. <laughs> Well, well exactly. actually, if that happens, we'll jump back on and re-record. I was going to say, I'm never, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to re-record with you. That's how yeah. that's going to work. It. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, no, awesome. Well, uh, Justin, we appreciate it. We'll uh, certainly check back in with you at the very least at, at the end of the year like we do and just take a temperature of the program and, and see where things are at. But it should be a really interesting year three for Tony Elliott. So I appreciate having you on. Absolutely. Anytime. All right, so we'll be back for more uh, season previews. This is the second one I've recorded, so uh, we're going to keep the train rolling along here uh, here in the last few days of July into August, uh, see how far we get. We have a lot more to go, and Joey is still out on, we, we call it, you know, our, our podcast paternity leave. He and I have now done that two different times. So uh, he'll be back uh, soon, and we'll be back with more previews soon. Uh, so for Joey, who's here in spirit for Justin Ferber. I'm Mike McDaniel. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And as always, go ACC.